Welcome everybody to today's uh, webinar from Rochester Electronics. My name is Ken Greenwood. Um, Dan Dice is in the States. We'll introduce ourselves in a minute. Authorized solutions for overcoming semiconductor end of life and supply, day, uh, supply chain uh, disruption. Uh, so I'm Ken Greenwood, the technical sales manager for Europe here. I've worked at Rochester for 10 years and previously had RF semiconductor experience. Dan, if uh, you want to introduce yourself. Thanks, Ken. My name is Dan Dice, and I'm the Director of Design Technology here at Rochester Electronics. A uh, couple design centers in uh, Rockville, Maryland, and Burnsville, Minnesota. And uh, prior to that, I was 20 years at LSI Logic. Thanks, Dan. Um, just a few housekeeping things to start with. We will send a copy of this presentation to everybody who's registered um, at the end of the event, so no need to take copious notes. Um, you can register questions during the presentation. What we'll try and do at the end is to uh, pick some of the best ones and answer those, but everybody who answer, uh, asks a question will get a, a written answer after um, the uh, presentation is closed. Um, so let's get on with. Uh, with you want to mention? You want to mention our colleagues? Uh, kind of monitoring oh, yeah. there. Uh, is, um, we have two colleagues who's help, helping us um, uh, organize the questions uh, at the end. Malcolm Kitchen, who I think a few of you may know, um, many years at NXP, and Stephen Morris, who's the general manager here in Europe. Okay. So um, I just thought we'd start with a, an overview of the complexity of the semiconductor supply chain. Um, the core element there, the fab through to test, is uh, typically a four months. It can be longer than that. It's rarely shorter than that. And each one of those is a, um, a quite often between the die and the assembly, uh, we're actually moving product, not only from one country, but across um, continents sometimes. Most of the packaging of semiconductors is done in the Far East, and then ultimately either the test is done there or it comes back to um, the original site again. If you add to the front of that, the lead times for um, the suppliers of chemicals and base copper lead frames, etc. You've got a very complex supply chain there. Um, add to the end of it um, delivery um, through a distributor generally and on to customers. Um, and you end up with a complex multinational um, supply chain. Now, the common element in all of that is the free movement of goods without problems. And I think what we're going to uh, what we're going to talk about today is one of the problems we have and are seeing in the current market, where there is disruption from the most unexpected quarters, and that's leading to uncertainty overall. So that's the background, really, to uh, to today's conversation. So um, what we're going to do is to look at um, four key dynamics at work in the in the market and explain what the problems are and what solutions there are out there or that people are, are working on to try and solve those. Um, we'll start with the most uh, pressing, I suppose, is the issues around uh, COVID-19. And uh, we're seeing sudden changes in lockdown controls at national borders. Uh, production capacity is impacted. Um, not only is uh, labor um, on but on or off, it's also um, having a, an impact on shift patterns. And uh, when you start and stop processes, there are issues in terms of uh, efficiencies and, um, and reliabilities. So we're seeing all of those elements at the moment. Basically, um, supply commitments, delivery promises um, are much less guaranteed these days than they are at the moment. And interestingly enough, um, freight capacity we're seeing is actually an issue because of the um, commercial aircraft reduction. The amount of freight which goes that route is actually having an impact on the availability of shipping um, 
capacity. So at all sorts of levels. And what happens typically in the semiconductor industry, which is a general roller coaster of oversupply and then over demand uh, throughout the years, when you get those, it takes a while to balance again afterwards. Uh, the supply constraints lead to customers then overcompensating and overstocking, and uh, we're in that sort of situation at the moment. So what can customers do to try and uh, reduce those risks? Uh, it's uh, it's easier said than done, but dual or multiple sourcing, and I'm not necessarily talking about dual or multi-sourcing multi manufacturers, but perhaps also distribution routes. People are looking for alternatives, backup plans, etc. Something where they've got instant stock available. Again, local sourcing is an ideal. In practice, it's rarely possible to source all of these things on your doorstep. And if you wanted an ideal view of, um, of a supplier, um, they should be authorized. That goes without saying. Um, we'll explain in more detail later on in the presentation exactly what the risks are with not going through an authorized supplier. Um, they should have um, stock which is compliant with AS6496. And again, Dan will talk about that and the importance of that later on in the presentation. Basically, full traceability, all the original guarantees and warranties. And uh, just to the side there, you can see the sort of levels of stock that Rochester has available instantly, ready to ship. Uh, we haven't closed our warehouse. That's been designated a critical supply element. Um, so it's been open and shipping all through this crisis. So 15 billion finished parts and around 12 billion die in stock. If we look at the second element here that is a, an ongoing and ever-present uh, issue in the um, semiconductor business is uh, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, industry rationalization continues. It's been a factor from, from day one, really. Um, last year, 2019, saw some very significant uh, takeovers, um, Infineon's takeover of, uh, of Cyprus, and obviously all the elements in that. Um, Infineon took um, International Rectifier under its wing um, a year or two previously, and Cyprus had swallowed Spansion and, uh, and, and a number of others, Ramtron, etc., in the, in the years previously. So you're ending up with some large groups um, out there. Um, the consolidation continues um, in the same way. Yeah, Ken, to, yeah. to add into this, you know, one of the things that happens with uh, consolidation is that anytime there's a merger and acquisition, uh, there's been plenty of studies done out there that the goal of any merger and acquisition in any market really is to finish and adjust all product lines within two years. What that translates into, obviously, is, is product uh, consolidation and division sell-offs like, uh, like like Ken was mentioning. But that also is, is discontinuation of products. So it, it, when, you, when you see these mergers and acquisitions happen, just know that the overall goal of the new consolidated entity is to finish all the analysis and product line planning and consolidation within a two-year window uh, to maintain all the benefits of that merger or acquisition that were intended to begin with. Yeah, and I mean, people think of uh, duplicate products as being perhaps the only issue that would eventually lead to a discontinuation, but we've seen it when it comes to uh, the fabulous strategy that one company has run, which is then totally incompatible with the fabulous strategy run by the, uh, the takeover party. And that then drives um, uh, an end of life for that whole fab um, process and the range of products that go with it. So uh, yes, it's it's a factor of day-to-day uh, -day life in the semiconductor industry. Um, so if you were trying to minimize the risk there and mitigate as much as possible 
um, those elements, which are uh, an ever present. Um, you might want to um, have a supplier that has the broadest um, relationships with, with as many of those uh, semiconductor manufacturers as possible. Um, a supplier that can transition and support from active shortages through to um, end of life and beyond uh, into manufacturing if at all possible. Um, and below you can see there a, um, uh, an example of the uh, Motorola to NXP uh, transition, both consolidation there and then spin-offs as well. And I'm, I'm pleased to say on, and in that version of it, we have relationships with all of those uh, suppliers we have 1.2 billion parts in stock for Nexperia, for instance, and uh, yes, they all continue now as part of our portfolio, plus we can support some of the original older Motorola parts, which I think Dan will talk about a bit later. So on the fabulous side, Dan. Yeah, thanks, Steve. You know, what? what is also evident in, in the marketplace, another market dynamic that uh, Really, all our all our customers need to watch out for is is the constant rise of fabless, and and not that that's that's a problem. It's just that when a device manufacturer is fully integrated and they have their own uh, fab process internally for most of their products, they more control their own destiny than when they are fabless from a fab process obsolescence perspective. So. When the challenge there is we've got shorter and shorter uh, component life cycles for a majority of the volume and more and more are fabless, which, which means they, they don't really control the fab process node availability. Uh, also, what is combined in this is the ever increasing cost per node for designing. And what that translates into is fewer products going forward in advanced nodes and each of those products demand more volume. What you can see in this chart is the cost to implement a design. This is courtesy of IBS uh, and this was in 2019 for each of the fab process nodes there and you can see for all intents and purposes Moore's law in a two-dimensional space ended about 28 to 22 nanometer. What that means is that you're not going to continue to see this ever increasing uh, or increasing transistor uh, density in two dimensions. You're going to have to go to three dimensions and you're not going to continue to see uh, megahertz uh, Im improvement all the time. And, and you're also going to see a consolidation of products going forward in advanced nodes where there will be fewer options available. A good example of this might be with uh, uh, Xilinx as, a, as an FPGA supplier uh, going forward into advanced process nodes, really not going to be able to afford to have the breadth of offering, let's say that they had at 130 nanometer, just not financially viable to go do that. You're also gonna see a lot more derivatives of parts that are reprogrammed uh, at test to become another part. Uh, the memory guys do that all the time. So so that you, going forward, you're going to see smaller geometries, larger investment needs, shorter life cycles, and that will translate into more uh, product discontinuation. So uh, next slide is uh, where we'll talk about the... Uh, oh, sorry. Know. No, that's okay. I got it. Um, so really what customers need are, are sources who can seamlessly span the transition to end of life. In other words, keep supplying product, don't go away just because the turns are down. Uh, classic distribution will be based on a turns business and uh, you, you don't want that. You, you want a source that can offer risk-free long-term supply. So that's, that's where a company like Rochester can step in and has stepped in for the last 35 years is keeping a product going longer than what that product was originally intended from a commercial viability perspective from the original manufacturer. 
Uh, so going forward, there's going to be even a greater demand to continue to do this. I'll turn that over to you now, Ken. So, no, yeah, well, actually, I was going to say, yeah, we can, uh, um, <laughs> the only way to, you know, reliably um, support a product like that, which is now at a point where you simply cannot port it, is, uh, is actually to store the wafer at the end of life uh, and as dye form. Um, then, yeah, you were going to say. Yeah. So, so really, when you, when you take a look at what uh, options there are, uh, of course, dye banking is a, is, a, is, a, is a big option for everyone to, to be doing when you can do that. Um, and and it's, it's one of those things where you also want your supplier to be fully within AS6496. AS6496 is the authorized channel, and, and you, what you really want is fully within AS6496. That means you don't want the possibility of mingling stock. You don't want the possibility of some pieces of your supplier being, oh, yeah, that's authorized over there, but not over there. It, it starts to become pretty squishy as to how much is authorized and how much isn't. So what you really need is product that's authorized, and I'll go through that, tested using the original manufacturing process and test program. 100% um, compliant, the original device specs, no new errata, uh, no part number change, current date code, no solderability risk, full CSC, traceability, and small quantities. At the For long-term systems, everybody's quantities are small by comparison to when the products were uh, at the peak of their volume. So... When, let's see, there we are. So, so what, what we have done uh, specifically in, in, in my group, but also in manufacturing here at Rochester is extended some key products. And, and this, this, is a, this is a list of products that, you know, a bunch of 8-bit eight, eight and 16-bit uh, NXP uh, MCUs. Um, TI's TMS320 series uh, of devices, <clears throat> and then the classic 8-bit NMOS, uh, 6802, 6809, 6821, 6840, 6850 products actually designed in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there's still some systems out there that, that need this. And, and, it, and it, goes, it goes on and on with partners that, we try to extend the life in every, every case with every single product for long-term systems. And that's kind of a key at Rochester anyway, is that we usually are well aware of the industry discontinuities that are happening and also well aware of the long-term system company's needs. And we immediately try to do everything we can to extend those key products. And these are, more examples of that of that product extension, and, and Dan, um, we we uh, we talked about the availability of wafer known good dye at the end of the process from the original fab. Um, again, minimizing risk and being able to then manufacture going forward. But that is nothing when you don't have the original test IP um, that sits alongside it. You, I mean, you simply That's couldn't right. produce a memory product there with the SRAM. Uh, with any confidence or e e economics at all without the original test program. Yeah, yeah I'll, go, I'll go through a little bit of the test um, aspect later when I kind of explain the difference between 6081, 6171, and 6496 uh, in, in, uh, in a slide coming up. But you're absolutely correct. Um, it, it, you know, effectively winging it with a data sheet test program um, that's not going to catch everything, and I'll explain why in, in just a little bit. The, the last example on this page was a, an ASIC that we uh, uh, cloned. And, 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 and by cloning an ASIC, uh, we are physically duplicating. This isn't a start from RTL, do a new layout, timing constraints, and go forward. What Rochester actually does here is, is clone 
parts as one of the solutions we offer. And, and what that really does is it gets you into the, the commercial avionics space with uh, minimum um, change. So a, a minimum change by a DO254 viewpoint. So, all right. So um, the final element really that we're gonna talk about today is where demand um, is, is uh, greater than supply. And this is a, again, um, we talked about the cyclical nature of uh, the semiconductor business boom and bust. Uh, we see it regularly, but there's an underlying element there, which is always there for products that are, have uh, disappeared from the market or have end of life, where there's still demand for those products, there are still people that will supply product, um, uh, not so um, uh, focused perhaps on where it's come from. But we've seen a lot of unauthorized sources attempting to fill the gap. That's just um, a day-to-day -day issue for us. We do sell to those people, but it's it's really the um, it's authorized that gives you that protection uh, in, in the end. Um, they're basically, they can bring a good product in that's been stocked okay, and they can also bring in recycled product that's come straight off a board somewhere and been, um, and been um, re, re, uh, rehashed and, and fed back into the system. Counterfeiting, I wanted to give you one real example here. Um, it was actually a product that was made end of life in 2003. Um, the manufacturers, because it was a core element of their radio systems and military radio systems, um, they continued to purchase it for a further, further 10 years. Before, they suddenly started to see, in fact, they started to see it before the uh, 10 years were up, about three or four years after, and then it continued to grow until it became uh, a bit of an epidemic for them, uh, of field failures. Basically, um, they were being returned from the field, and ultimately, they identified it as being this particular chip. Now, interestingly enough, they tested the product when it came in through the door and it worked fine. Um, at the time, it all looked great. Uh, they Then when they got the returned product, they started to x-ray uh, the product to see what, uh, if there were any issues there, no fault found, nothing really from the outside of the product either. But when they did um, scanning electron microscope, um, a, a view of it, they started to see um, areas of uh, corrosion um, underneath the dye, so under the bond element there, and actually on the pads themselves. And when they'd done that work and they'd done a, um, an analysis of the materials that they found in there, they realized it was a chlorine compound um, that, uh, well, the only conclusion they could come to was that it had entered the component during recovery. So someone had pulled it from a board, they'd washed the product in a corrosive um, substance which had slowly percolated its way into the plastic package and then destroyed pads and bond wires. I mean, we've also seen issues, by the way, um, uh, from other customers where they've had product returned and bond wires had disappeared. Now, that was an impossible situation uh, at the test part of it because they tested fine. Um, a year or two later, the bond wires were eaten away. So in the end, what this meant for them was a full recall of all systems in the field. And what we're trying to demonstrate here is that um, the, the fact that it tests okay for one test at one point in time, if you don't have full uh, traceability and guarantees around that product, you risk uh, in-service field returns. And, and Dan, yeah. you're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about, um, about the testing and the difference between... Uh, yeah, just, well, uh, yeah, go ahead. yeah, just go back, go back a, uh, one slide there, Ken. I, I did want to add into there that, you know, the, the main message that we're giving here is that authenticity does not mean reliability. So this example here, that's just one example. There are, there are millions of examples out there, but this example, it, that was an authentic part. That was genuinely manufactured in the beginning by the original component manufacturer. 
but authenticity does not mean reliability. And that's, that's the biggest difference between an independent distribution channel and a fully authorized distribution channel. So go ahead, Ken. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's over to you really on in terms of, uh, of the testing element, uh, I suppose, Dan. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I just talk a little bit about tests for, for a minute because uh, testing a part we, we sometimes think of well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go buy these parts and then I'm going to go have them tested. Test program development, validation, it, 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 validation development. Uh, what you have to keep in mind is that the original component manufacturer test solutions are the result of the highest volume customers feeding back test escape information to them and the original component manufacturers supplementing the original test program to catch the most obscure possible escape failure that their highest volume customer ever fed back. So there are year, man years and man years involved in creating these final test programs from the original component manufacturer. Those test programs, in fact, may take just as long to develop as the original product does if it's a complex product. So to, to say I'm going to go have the part tested is actually dismissing the man years involved in creating an original component manufacturer test solution. And, and also you're willing then to accept escapes you're willing to accept that, ah, oh, yeah, I tested by a data sheet, but uh, yeah, I know that there are gonna be escapes, there's gonna be some product that uh, don't work, even though the data sheet testing says it will. So that's, that's I, I guess what I wanna emphasize in test is that just saying test is not the original component manufacturer's test program. Those things are millions of lines, millions of lines tens or hundreds of man years involved in creating those things. Starting even back when it was a 16-bit a world, those test solutions were incredibly complex. Yeah. Okay. So so let's talk a, talk a little bit further about tests and then I, and I won't get off that, uh, I'll get off that high horse just a little bit. This is a chart that uh, it, it's, it's been out there in other forms, but uh, we've, we've modified it, improved it a little bit. And it, and it highlights what the counterfeit types are that you can get versus the type of testing that is done. And, and likely, uh, it, first of all, the independent distribution market is, is uh, primarily based with uh, AS6081 and AS6171 testing. And, and what you can tell from this chart is that there are going to be escapes, even from just a data sheet perspective, that none of those methods will pull out. And the only place you're really gonna get no counterfeits is through the authorized distribution. Conversely, if you have to go through independent distribution, you better not just settle with AS6081. Clearly AS6081 is uh, allowing for a, a whole ton more of, of uh, escapes to come through that are counterfeit. And that's not going to be any reliability testing either. At least with AS6171, if it's done correctly, if it's actually put on a tester and done through and through, you're more likely to catch counterfeits. So. It, it really is a, a, a message that don't dismiss the value of AS6496 authorized distribution and don't compromise just with AS6081 visual inspection. If you're going to go out to the independent market, you better insist on AS6171 and drive that testing and reliability testing if it's in the right 
uh, uh, health and, and uh, all those markets uh, or even uh, automotive, anything that's going to impact human life, you, you want to do reliability testing. Okay. Yep. So go Sorry. ahead. Go yeah. Ahead. Um, really, uh, just to summarize um, uh, what an authorized supplier gives you, it means you don't have any additional testing, no third party testing, no extra third party testing costs. It'll minimize um, any corporate liabilities. There are a couple of, uh, of end customers here who insist that it's your responsibility to ensure that you uh, bring um, original and uh, non-counterfeit product into your devices. Um, it's your reputation ultimately at risk. Um, and as we've seen on the other side, um, less rework, production yields are better, and perhaps in service life that, uh, is, that is extended. All those things you may not see initially when you get that product in, which can ultimately come and, and bite you. So in summary, um, Rochester has uh, a lot of product available, 15 billion parts uh, in stock. A lot of those are active as well as um, still, still available in the market, still active through uh, the, the mainline distributors, but we are there as a, as a source of protection um, in uh, times of uncertainty. Um, and then we also have uh, a huge um, end of life and obsolete stock. And then for manufacturing, um, we also have uh, 12 billion die in stock, which allows us to build an awful lot of products, along with the test systems that go with it, along with all of the authorizations, which allow us to continue producing that part, the same part number to guarantee the same spec. Um, and really we've talked about how broad um, we have 70, uh, of the leading semiconductor manufacturers as, uh, as franchises, uh, which we support and in many cases have been supporting for nearly 40 years. So uh, we have some really deep relationships there. Um, many of those names you see there are no longer uh, around in their own right, but we still manufacture products in some of those instances for um, long-term customers. Um, and just to uh, again re-emphasize the um, author authorized manufacturer nature of Rochester, we are shown as a as a manufacturer on IHS and silicon expert databases. So you'll see um, uh, in this instance uh, uh, a Harris part, Intersil part, um, went from the market maybe five ten years ago. Uh, we still produce that part from wafer and uh, you can see our stock through the IHS database at least and uh, visit us on uh, at, at the Rochester uh, website to show you. But uh, we are constantly adding to that. Um, I can't give you a uh, an absolute guarantee that all our capabilities are shown on there today, but um, please ask if you can't see something there. There are as often some things we can do behind the scenes and other things that we're working on. So um, that's us. Um, if there are any uh, questions, um, please uh, let us know um, after the event. I'm happy to answer those, and we will send you this this, uh, this uh, presentation out uh, by email to all the attendees. Um, Dan, anything else from you? No, I, I think I think the overall message, Ken, is that uh, stay authorized if you can stay authorized. If the product is available in the authorized channel, you should try to get it uh, through authorized at, at every single time there. And and through independent distribution, you may have to go there for for a solution that isn't available in the authorized market. And that's fine. Just don't settle for AS6081. Force the issue into AS6171 and just realize that authenticity is not reliability. And, and, and think about when you're purchasing product um, that way that, that any test done, any test at any test house didn't come from the original component manufacturer. 
So you're going to have test escapes, period, the end. That's what you're going to have because they simply don't have the millions of lines of code for a product or the, uh, uh, the original test solution from the original component manufacturer that has every possible fault that they ever had that was, that was tied to the fab process on which it was made to begin with and deep knowledge at the OCM. So just keep that in mind. That's kind of the main message of this, uh, this entire webinar is, is stay, uh, stay within authorized every chance you have and then realize the alternatives when you don't. So, yeah. So with that, I think, uh, I, I think we're turning it over to our colleagues and see what kind of questions we got and uh, go yeah, from there. Hey, Dan, I've got a question for you. It's Malcolm here. Um, yeah. We've all been introduced to the uh, new thing of a lockdown due to the uh, dreaded COVID-19. What's the impact to this to a semiconductor fab? Is, is it even possible to interrupt this process and what would be the impact? Well, actually, yeah, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a good question. And uh, let's, let's kind of step through the reality of fab operations. Uh, it, 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 they are primarily uh, without humans for a vast majority of the process steps. Uh, in any sem semiconductor fab, uh, the humans are really there for monitoring. And, and frankly, most of that can be done remotely. Uh, so it, there haven't really been impacts on the semiconductor fab fabrication cycles yet. But but what's coming into them for orders or what's able to leave, that's the biggest impact right now. Uh, it, but the actual cycle itself, once wafers are started, um, it's a fairly automated process in, in most of the fabs today. Okay. Any other any other questions? So just picking up on that again, Dan. So that, does that does that mean that the, effectively the the lead would the lead time of that particular semiconductor be impacted? Well, the the fab cycle is just part of it. There 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 is the assembly and test cycle too, and that's where things do get more impacted. Uh, it, it, inevitably, you're going to have. That's why I said leaving the foundry is certainly going to uh, it, it is going to be impacted. How much it, transportation is going between uh, point A and point B? That's a that's a likely impact right now. Then you're going to have an assembly impact uh, because that's where you start to bring in supplies like mold compound and 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 and, and die attach and bond wires and all this other stuff. And humans are involved in the setups and, and the teardowns at, at the assembly uh, places. So that's where the shifts inside shifts. And yes, there has been an impact at assembly. Then there also is an impact at, at test um, because that's where humans are involved again. So it, 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 the, the, the semiconductor fab part of it is what isn't impacted, but the rest of the supply chain there back on on Ken's uh, first slide or so, that's where it all, the humans start to get involved in and everything gets impacted again. Great, thanks Dan. Dan, Dan or Ken, there's, um, you guys were talking about uh, authenticity. Um, we just got a question that's come through asking about um, to elaborate a little bit on authenticity, what exactly do we mean by that? Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, first, uh, first of all, just a, a little more background on myself. I, I, um, in, in North America, I help train the Customs and Border Patrol and Homeland Security agents on what is counterfeit from a semiconductor industry perspective, because I'm physically located close to Washington, D.C., so um, I, I go do that. And counterpart in, in Europe, um, is uh, at, at Infineon, and, and he and I have actually talked quite a bit about uh, how um, how to present this topic. So, authenticity it, it is is a it, 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 the part itself was manufactured in the beginning at the original semiconductor company. It is authentic. It is the correct. Uh, 
uh, the, the, the die came from them, the assembly solution came from them. Everything about the part is authentic. What we don't know about parts once they leave the authorized channel is where they've been. And that can include, uh, that can include they've been mounted on a board and powered up and used for a while and then pulled off the board and, and marked as new. That can include also that they weren't ever done that way, but they weren't stored correctly. They're authentic, but they weren't stored correctly. So now you've got some, some moisture issues. And, you know, plastic parts on the shelf, if you aren't storing them correctly, will absorb moisture, will absorb uh, contaminants. And then in the long run, you won't have a reliable part, even though you never used it, just because you didn't store it correctly. And, so, and Dan, um, Dan, yeah, there is a, a, a fixation with date code. Date code really isn't the main issue here. No, it's no. Storage facility, it's the storage um, quality that you've had for the life of that product. That's, have, that's correct, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I understand that uh, many, um, uh, much of the market measures it in terms of date code. We understand that fully. But actually, it's about the traceability and the fact that you've stored that part all the way through its life that will give you the uh, success or failure if uh, not, not necessarily the date code on it. Yeah, date code is a first order uh, question to ask. And it's the easiest question to ask, but it's not really digging into the details. Date code is a very easy thing. Oh, I don't want anything older than two years date code or three years date code. Uh, that doesn't really matter as much as how was it stored? Where was it stored? Did it stay within the authorized channel? Those are the more important questions to ask. It, it's, it's really easy to say, oh, I demand no date codes older than this. Well, that, that that's that's not that's just the easy way out of asking that's not really uh the full story at all because if it's correctly stored if it's stored well if it's documented to be stored well and you've got all that proof uh their date code doesn't doesn't really matter it, it 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 is it is really how and who did the storing and uh what did it stay within the authorized channel Hey Dan, just just staying on the date code issue. So if if Rochester do a product life extension from a from a last time buy, what would be the date code supplied to a customer, uh, and also how long can you store a die for? Oh, that can that can that can certainly vary. And and let's let's kind of step through a couple different things there. One is like, uh, for example, with uh, uh, with the with the NXP product extension that we did, that was that was a a lot of uh, wafer, original wafer. Um, let me just talk about the wafer side of it for just a second. Rochester's been storing wafer for over thirty years, and we understand and continually monitor everything we have, and we know how to store wafer, and and we've got the largest dye bank in the world, so not concerned about how Rochester stores the wafer and for the duration. That isn't, that isn't an issue at all. From a finished goods perspective, we have an audited warehouse, all the correct humidity and temperature controls that are needed and audited not just by us, but by also by the OCMs. So we have a, a path there to stay within the authorized channel. Everything we have in the warehouse is authorized. And, and for date codes there, we could have finished goods that are upwards of 10, 20, 30 years. We'll do solderability tests. If people want us to do solderability tests, we'll do uh, whatever kind of testing to validate that product for them if they want extra assurance. Uh, but we've not seen any problems that, uh, that, that wouldn't be expected that we don't know about ahead of time that, that aren't part of a particular product type. I mean, you get different lead finishes that... Um, but we're we're very knowledgeable of all of that. So, does that kind of answer your question? Um, it, it hopefully it does. If if not, somebody can uh, ask away, ask in the in the chat thing a little bit more. Yeah, that's fine, Dan. Thanks. Okay. Just right. uh, just just something on authenticity again, Dan. Um, mm -hmm. 
talk you mentioned recycling semi components that sounds like a scary thing um how, how much of that do we think is going on and, well, and is well, it possible to even spot that through a visual inspection sometimes yes and sometimes no uh you, you know the, so yes it is scary but but it uh it, it uh doesn't um what it does let's let's come back a little bit you know the, every, maybe a lot of people have seen the images of very crude uh uh Pull, board pulling operations going on, and that, and, and and frankly, I think that that uh, that picture of uh, you know in the in the Guangdong province of, of Shenzhen, China, where they're 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 banging out parts on the side of a river somewhere, that's not a a a, a where you're going to get high quality um, board pulls. Uh, they have very very good board rework stations that for, for not a lot of money out there. And, and you can pull BGA products, great big BGA products off of boards uh, and have those professionally reworked. Um, and and it, the visual inspection of that, it, you may catch the rework, you may not. And again, it's an authentic product. Uh, so it comes down to then uh, what are you going to do for reliability testing, what are you going to do for AS6171? Are you going to test this uh, product at temperature? Because that's typically what degrades over time. Um, yeah, it is kind of scary, it, it, but but there are ways to uh, incorporate a test scheme to mitigate a lot of that risk. And then somebody, when you're purchasing product that way, you have to weigh that out against your end product, uh, human uh, health and, and and impact and so forth. Uh, you know, is it is it just uh, a life critical type of application or life impacting? Uh, and and then weigh out your test strategy accordingly. So yeah, rework product uh, is authentic product that is uh, uh, if it's being sold as new, it's counterfeit. Uh, by definition, um, but it's also uh, authentic is not reliable. So and just, just, yeah, and just going back to the date code, um, let me, uh, there's a question here which um, is asking about whether um, the length of storage has an impact on reliability of the part if the storage conditions were not adequate. Basically, if the storage conditions were not adequate, all all bets are off. Uh, that is the ultimate um, uh, thing which will define uh, quite often the quality of the goods that you're getting in. Date code is the easiest thing to monitor. You just simply can't see from the outside of the device whether a part has been stored correctly during its life before it got to you. Date code is something that is there on the package and therefore people focus on that. It is um, a, a false uh, confidence, I think, um, and we can demonstrate that in terms of the date codes that we regularly sell without without problems. So, uh, yeah, I'll emphasize again, date code is not the defining factor about good or bad quality product. I, and by, I, the, I, and by the way, um, our suppliers, all of the people that we've uh, that we showed on that last slide, they refer customers to us, knowing full well that the product that we have, older date code product, is is past their normal st um, storage conditions. They pass those customers to us with full confidence that we are going to support them without problems, with all the original uh, guarantees and warranties that, that that they had originally. So, the suppliers regard us as a trusted partner for the long term there um, um, for 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 their customers when times uh, are difficult and there's shortages around they will come to us and drive customers to us to uh, to support so uh, just to emphasize that we're not doing this in a in a vacuum we're doing it fully trusted uh, as a fully trusted element of the supplier just to just to add on to that Ken I, I think the uh you know that <clears throat> what the 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 benchmark of a two-year date code or a three-year date code out there is primarily because how the OCMs pack their product into boxes 
allows for um, less than adequate storage, meaning not ideal storage for a semiconductor component for the two years because of how they packed it. It's a very easy, trivial thing to, to say two years or three year date code, we won't take anything older than that. But it, it isn't the whole story. That's our, that's our message to the audience here is that that is just an easy thing to say because it allows for anything just about to happen from a storage perspective for the first two or three years. After that, decode isn't a metric of good. It becomes now, how did you store it? And, and that's the difference in a fully authorized solution. You're going to have date codes that are longer than the three years, but they're going to be fully um, uh, fully stored in a, in a way that's uh, still reliable. Okay. So uh, All right. just, just, just one, uh, one last question here, I think, uh, Dan. So, um, Dan and Ken, um, you talk about Rochester extending the product life of a semiconductor after its last time by. Is this a risky, ex is this a risky exercise? Well, I mean, no. Uh, it, 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 again, everything we do is above board. So if my design group goes and uh, ports a, uh, a, an Intel 186XL microprocessor from one fab to another, we have authorization to do so from the original component manufacturer. We have their original test program to validate it. Uh, we took the NXP ADC 592 and and ported that to another foundry uh, fab process when when their fab process was uh, discontinued, with the full knowledge, with their full test suite, uh, with all the design data, the original Spice decks, the uh, GDS2, and and we physically clone the device. So risky. Uh, it, it's it's an engineering effort, uh, but we we have not failed in when we say we're going to port the device for a customer, and we have the authorization to do so. We commit to doing that, and, and we've we've done that successfully for a dozen years. So, no, I don't think it's risky because we're sitting there with the original design from the original manufacturer with authorization with the original test program to validate. And we add to that original test program, which that's a whole other webinar some other time as to what we do there. But, but that's a, you know, that it, you know, I think there's, uh, there's plenty of, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's risk, but then no, not, not really. Um, Dan, um, another one uh, has come in uh, in terms of what happens if we don't have the test program. Um, just to emphasize there, uh, all product that we manufacture, we have the original test programs for. Um, so when you see a Rochester built part, we had the original test programs and that's how we're able to guarantee it's 100% in compliance with the original spec. Um, we do not have all the test programs for everything we have on the shelf, but all of those parts are authorized and therefore have been tested. The last thing they did, they had done to them before they left to come and see us was to be tested. So we have that assurance and we know where they've been. We know that they've been stored up until, uh, you know, in, in, under the correct conditions. Um, the risk is absolutely minimized. But yes, we do not have the test programs for everything that we stock on the shelves. We, we have authorization in order to sell it and we know that the original manufacturer was the last person to touch it. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we've, we've had our challenges where we don't have a test program and we go port a product somewhere with authorization. The original component manufacturer um, essentially has said, yes, go ahead, but we don't have any archive for the product. If that happens, uh, we, we do a tremendous amount of effort and we pump man years into it to develop a test solution. But you're not going to do that on a complex microprocessor. You're not going to do that on a, an extremely complex ASIC. 
uh, you're not going to port that type of product and we simply won't sign up for it. Uh, the only time we've been able to do this uh, where we create our own test solution is on a, a fairly um, uh, moderately complex or even easy part where we can prove that we have covered all the fault modes and then we go further into characterization, which the original component manufacturer only did when they first developed the product. And we compare our part to the original part all the way down to edge rates and power and everything else. So uh, yes, we've gotten into that situation before, but with complex, extremely complex products, you simply can't do it. Okay. Okay. Good stuff. I think there's, there's one question on here um, about a specific uh, storage problem on one of our suppliers. So I'm, I, I can't see who that's from, but if you'd like to um, send us that directly, we'd be happy to talk to you about that, but we can't really talk about that on the, on the WebEx. Yeah. yeah so any questions, by the way, yeah, we, we will have um, the details of, of who you are uh, without sounding like Big Brother. Uh, but we'll be able to answer all of those individually um, straight after this. Yes, and, and you'll have our, our names and our email contacts uh, to with any follow-up questions too. We'll make sure that uh, we, we do the best we can to answer your questions. Okay, um, I think uh, we've come to the natural end here. Um, thank you everybody for attending and uh, we may see you at some point again in the future on a range of different subjects. You never know. Okay, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Take care. See you. Thank you, guys. All right. Bye now. Bye.